Welcome everyone to this webinar titled the Federal Climate Action Reboot will be starting now. Uh, I want to welcome everyone who's calling in uh, for the next hour. We have exciting speakers from Capitol Hill to West Virginia, from the faith community to the climate NGO, NGO world, who will give the latest on efforts to pass major federal climate legislation. They'll also answer any questions you may have and give you concrete actions you can take to help get this legislation over the finish line this summer. I am Mike Tidwell, Executive Director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network and CCAN Action Fund. I'll be emceeing this webinar. Soon you'll be hearing from our featured speakers, Lena Moffitt of Evergreen Action, the Reverend Michael Malcolm of the People's Justice Council, Angie Rosser of West Virginia Rivers, and Quentin Scott of CCAN Action Fund. And if you have questions for any of these folks, put them in the Q&A chat spot and we'll pose them in, to our speakers in the second half of this webinar. But first, a bit of background. In March 2021, President Joe Biden proposed his $2 trillion American Jobs Plan, which included $550 billion in climate spending, including support for new wind and solar power, efforts to decarbonize transportation, and the creation of a civilian climate core, among other climate justice spending. That proposal, following the legislative path called budget reconciliation in the U.S. Senate, was later trimmed and given the name Build Back Better, but it still included the $550 billion in climate invested investments. Then that policy was blocked in the U.S. Senate in late December. Now it's May, and the new budget reconciliation talks are still happening. Yes, they're happening. Some at the White House are calling the new discussion package the, quote, anti-inflation budget reconciliation bill, end quote. It would, it would cut prescription drug costs, reduce the national deficit, and reduce skyrocketing energy costs by investing in wind and solar and electric transportation. Yes, the same $550 billion in climate investments have survived all the slicing and dicing over the past year and are still on the table. Why? Because 50 U.S. senators, 50 of them, have said all along that they support this and they support it now, including Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. This support is a testament to the strength of our climate movement, to the hard work that all of you on this call have been doing for the last few months and years. So we have the votes for transformative climate policy. We just need everyone's help again right now to pass this policy this summer, perhaps by the Senate's June recess. In the meantime, here's a quick video from our friends at Evergreen Action that lays out all the stakes of this climate policy. So, you might have heard, we have some problems to solve. Inflation. Gas prices. A Russian invasion of Ukraine. Climate change. President Biden and Congress have a lot to tackle right now, and not much time to do it. There is one thing they can do that would take on all those issues and more. They can invest in clean energy. Okay, bear with me. Let's start with inflation. You may know that inflation is at its highest point in decades. What you may not know is that America's dependence on fossil fuels is largely at fault. Seriously, over half the total inflation increase is because of fossil fuels alone. If President Biden wants to fight inflation, he should invest in clean energy. Speaking of high gas prices, National petroleum prices are up 32% since last year. And this past winter, some families' gas heating bills more than doubled from the year prior. Meanwhile, the cost of clean energy has been dropping. Since 2010, the cost of utility-scale solar power has plummeted 74%. The cost of wind energy dropped 86% between 2009 and 2018. 86%. Today, clean energy is by far the most affordable option. If Democrats want to bring down energy prices, they should invest in clean energy. One reason fossil fuel prices are up? Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. Petro dictators like Putin know the world still relies on their oil and gas, and that gives him enormous leverage. President Biden and other world leaders have tried to reduce their dependence on Russian oil, but the only way to truly undermine the power of a petro dictator is to end our reliance on fossil fuels altogether and invest in clean energy. Want more reasons? 
If Democrats want to address decades of environmental racism and cut toxic pollution, they should invest in clean energy. If Democrats want to pass one of the most cost-effective climate policies in American history, they should invest in clean energy. If Democrats want to mobilize young voters in November and protect their majority, they should invest in clean energy. And yeah, Climate change. Climate change. Climate change. Climate change. Climate change. We're out of time to limit warming. If Biden and Democrats in Congress want to avert climate catastrophe for generations to come, they should invest in clean energy. In summary, if President Biden and Democrats in Congress want to pass a bill that will cut inflation, lower energy costs, undermine petro dictators like Putin, address a long history of environmental racism, build more resilient communities, drastically improve air quality, deliver more reliable electricity, create jobs, and save taxpayers ridiculous amounts of money, all while energizing the most crucial voting bloc they need to protect their majority in November, they should invest in clean energy. The next few weeks are make or break for Biden and for our planet. Help Democrats get the message. Share this video, then visit evergreenaction.com slash call to call your senator. And yes, tell them to invest in clean energy. Video that is, and thank you so much to our friends at Evergreen Action for making it. Uh, now there's just a quick question. Will the $550 billion package of climate spending that's actually still on the table really move our nation toward the president's goal of cutting greenhouse gas emissions 50% below 2005 levels by 2030? And the answer is yes, it will. You'll want to stick around later in this webinar where we'll show you a slightly wonky but totally compelling graph that makes that very point. So, okay. Now we know the climate policy will work and we know it's legislative history and we know the deadline ahead of us. Let me now introduce our first speaker who will give us an update on the political landscape on Capitol Hill and our path forward. Lena Moffitt is chief of staff of Evergreen Action, one of the most dynamic and effective adv advocacy groups working on climate policy today. She is also, Lena is, one of the most talented, passionate, and effective climate advocates I have ever met. Lena, take it away. Wow, Mike, thank you so much. That really means a lot uh, coming from you. Been in this fight for so long, and I was already pretty jazzed. Uh, Sorry, I'm starting my video here. I was already pretty excited after y'all played our video. How sweet. And I was uh, slacking with our digital team because wow, that video is really good. <laughs> I have to say it. Um, well, thank you so much, Mike. It is an honor to be here with you all and to all the participants. I'm really excited to see such a big group of folks joining because we know, as you noted, our climate movement is just growing. The number of people who care about this issue and recognize that we have a narrow and closing window of opportunity to take the action that we need. This is front and center for so many people, including so many voters who elected the Democrats who are in office right now and need to deliver. So my message of the day right now is that the behind the scenes read from Capitol Hill is that this bill is not dead. It has been through a lot of uh, fits and starts, and it's been through a lot of different iterations, but what we are hearing, and this may not be reported in the media, so I think it's really important that we are talking about this one-on-one, uh, -on -one, so to speak, right now. We wanna get more media on it, um, but it's mostly behind the scenes right now, is that there are positive, productive conversations being had right now that lend themselves to real progress, and that the Senate could still put this thing together and pass it before they go on recess for the summer. So as we know, uh, those of us that are lucky enough or challenged enough to advocate on Capitol Hill, legislation often dies in the heat of the summer. So we have to get this thing done, particularly before August. Uh, Y'all have probably seen that the, um, the Senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin, who in many, in many ways is, is the decider here, has been convening these bipartisan energy conversations. Um, in a lot of respects, that's a bit concerning. Uh, I will admit as an activist myself, who's uh, yes, been in this fight for about 15 years, but comes from New Mexico. I'm not actually from DC. I try to bring an outsider perspective on this. 
more focus on working with Republicans for a bill that they can agree to, we know that's not going to be the legislation that we need to tackle this crisis. Uh, and so those bipartisan energy conversations in some way are a distraction and they need to end them and move forward with talking about reconciliation. Well, some good news. Senator Manchin has had several of those meetings. He was actually supposed to have another one this week. It has been canceled. We've also heard that the next one uh, that was going to happen early next week has also been canceled, I believe is the latest news. And so what we think uh, is that now is a critical time to remind him of his interest in doing things like tackling inflation, reducing the deficit, advancing clean energy, and that to do all of those things, he needs to get back to reconciliation and pass that bill as fast as possible, definitely before they go on summer recess. Um, we think that a few key targets to talk to about the need to pass this bill are those Democrats who've been engaging with him in those bipartisan energy conversations um, for a number of reasons. We heard the behind the scenes that Senator Manchin invited that cadre of Democrats to those conversations because those are the ones that he likes talking to. Uh, it's amazing how so much of this is really driven by personalities uh, and who Manchin likes talking to. All right, those are folks who he's going to listen to. I will admit, Evergreen Action does not have a direct line into Senator Manchin and he does not listen to us. So we are reaching out to those Democrats who he does listen to and asking them to say, now is the time. For all the reasons that we outlined in that video, we want to tackle the climate crisis, of course. We want to ad address inflation. We want to decrease the deficit. We want to undercut the power of petro dictators like Putin. And we want to decrease Americans' energy bill and protect consumers from the volatility of fossil fuels. For all those reasons that Manchin himself has said he's interested in, he needs to pass the reconciliation package with the full $555 billion in investments. A number of reasons why he has indicated support for those. those. Those investments are, quote unquote, paid out over 10 years. The price tag is over the 10-year budgetary window that the budget reconciliation bill is supposed to be paid out over. They've been negotiated, as Mike said. We've done the hard work on these climate investments, and there is agreement around most of them. So we are asking folks in particular to go to that handful of Democrats right now and tell them now is the moment you absolutely need to weigh in with Senator Manchin, tell him we've got to pass this bill right now. And I'll just tick through that list so folks have it. The Democrats who've been reportedly engaging with Manchin on uh, these bipartisan talks are Senator Coons, Senator Carper, Senator Hickenlooper, Senator Schatz, Senator Warner, Senator Kelly, and Senator Sinema. So if you are from any of those states, um, Delaware, Colorado, Hawaii, Virginia, Arizona in particular, you have a really important role to play here. And it is time to call your Senator and make sure that they are pressing folks like Senator Manchin to move this bill forward and to support it and to pass the full 555 billion for all those reasons we just talked about. So I think with that, um, I will end my spiel and then we can go to our next speaker and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Thank you all. Fantastic. Thank you, Lena Moffitt of Evergreen Action. Thank you for the great video you all have made for all your advocacy and leadership. So we've heard the political argument for how and why we can pass big climate legislation on Capitol Hill, but climate change has always been a moral issue, frankly, above all else, which is why at this pivotal moment in our nation's moral history, we've asked the Reverend Michael Malcolm, founder and director of the People's Justice Council to join us as part of Joe Biden's all of government approach to global warming, the president's policy is that no less than 40% of all investments and benefits from climate policy must accrue to historically disadvantaged communities in the US. And no one has fought harder for this and other EJ policies than Reverend Malcolm. Reverend, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, Brother Quentin, uh, Brother Jamie and Mike for this invite. Listen, I don't wanna take a whole lot of time. They gave me like six minutes, but I really think it'll just take me three to really point to you and, and point out the fact that we absolutely need to pass legislation that provides for our vulnerable communities. 
Beloved, uh, we have an opportunity to ensure that we are caring for our communities. I'm out here in the streets. I'm out here in these communities. I'm seeing the devastation. I'm seeing the hurt. We need to provide provisions for our communities. We have an opportunity to do so. This is not dead, it's not over. We have an opportunity, but it's gonna take us to push. It's gonna take all of us pushing, not just those who uh, may have influence over matching, but we the people have the power. And if we can rise up and we can make our voices known, we can make enough noise that everybody takes, uh, uh, may, uh, everybody pays attention to what we have. Uh, but also in that, there are already provisions that have been made. The second thing that we've got to do is not just push, but also pay attention, you all. We've got to pay attention to where this money that we have is going. We have an opportunity to take that uh, 50, uh, 63 billion, I believe it was, uh, that was in that in, in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure framework and help our states to shape those so that they do get to the communities that actually need the help first and foremost. And we can make the investments to ensure that our planetary health um, is also seen about while we're pushing also for the further climate provisions. Again, we've got some agreement on it. We have an opportunity to really push this. It is a moral imperative that we push it because if we can help the people, we can heal the planet. I'll say that one more time just so you'll be able to hear it and hopefully you'll get fired up behind it. If we help the people, we can heal the planet. The provisions that we have uh, are simply not enough. We need more. These provisions that we have been uh, promised and we're we are now coming to make do on our promise. Um, these provisions that have been promised are, are a tremendous help for these communities. And so if for no other reason, remember those that are hurting. Remember that mother who is going to bed and having to figure out if she's going to ensure that her family has healthy food or if they're going to keep the lights on in a real way. Or that grandmother who is deciding whether or not she'll take her uh, medicine and pace it out so that it can thin out enough so she can make sure her utilities are paid in addition to being able to make sure she's got enough medicine to last her for the month. Pay attention. Pay attention to where this money is going. We know that we have benefits, but we need to pay attention to where the investments are going because that's what builds wealth in our communities. That's what gives us longevity in our communities. That's what helps to, to sustain us. I need your help. Others need your help. Those that are in community that look like me and beyond need your help right now. We're at a pivotal moment where we can either decide we're going to do something about it or we're going to sit back and complain. Beloved, I need you to do something about it. I need you to get fired up with the expectations that we will win. So while we're pushing, let us also pay attention. Thank you for my time. Thank you so much, Reverend Malcolm. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. and. Uh, I'm fired up and uh, we're about to hear some specific things that people can do. Uh, remember in the meantime that if you have any questions for any of our speakers or any questions about the budget reconciliation discussions going on in Capitol Hill, you can post your questions in the Q&A section of this webinar. So just go ahead and post your questions. Uh, next, I wanna hand it over to Quentin Scott, who is federal campaign coordinator for the Chesapeake Climate Action Network and CCAN Action Fund. Quentin is gonna show us that wonky but compelling graph I mentioned earlier. It outlines just how the federal climate investments, again, on the table now, would actually get us within spitting distance of the president's goal of cutting US greenhouse gas emissions 50% below 2005 levels by 2030. Quentin. Thank you, Mike, for that introduction. And it's my honor to be speaking alongside this distinguished group. Uh, as Mike had mentioned, uh, CCAN uh, has been advocating and pushing for reconciliation since President Biden announced the American Jobs Plan about a year ago. 
I can't lie, it's been absolutely a roller coaster ride. Uh, and we've certainly had a lot of setbacks, but we're not giving up uh, because honestly, we can't. Uh, if you spend any time around this CCAN office, you're going to realize two things. One, we're sports fans, and two, we love sports analogies. So here's one for all the basketball fans who watched that Bucks comeback against the Celtics, and I apologize to any Celtics fans that are on the call today. Uh, but the science is clear. We're in the fourth quarter, we're down by eight, and it's only two minutes to go. If we don't want to lose the game, we have to reduce our emissions by 50% by 2030. We don't have time to waste. Every possession matters. Every year matters. We simply can't turn the ball over at this stage of the game. Our organizations and political leaders have an obligation to stay focused and pass climate legislation in 2022. You'll hear Democrats talk about the climate provisions in the bipartisan infrastructure bill or potential climate provisions in the China competitiveness bill. And those are great investments, but let's be very clear. We need more. So let's take a quick look at the graph. Thank you. And so if you look at that very top line, that is where we were uh, going to be uh, by 2035 without the bipartisan infrastructure bill. If you look at the very next line, the purple line, you'll see that is where we're going to be now that the bipartisan infrastructure bill has passed. Not very much difference. And you see uh, where our goal is for 50% reductions in 2030. We're way off from that target and we're way off of 2035. And if we stretch that graph out probably to 2050, we probably won't make it to 50% by 2050 either. So it's very clear, we need the $550 billion in, in investments from the Build Back Better Act or in reconciliation now that the House passed last November. Uh, it's gonna get us nearly to the 50%. And there's some other modeling that suggests that with this major federal investment, it'll inspire states to do their own investments and their own state actions that will then cover up that last little bit and get us actually 50% uh, down, 50% uh, uh, reduction by 2030. So that's why we're really inspired and we're gonna keep going and not giving up. And as we've been talking endlessly, we know Senator Manchin is gonna play a critical role in these negotiations. And that is why you know we're going to continue to push uh, every day uh, until uh, something is passed. So I just dropped in the chat uh, an opportunity to volunteer. For the last several months, we've been connecting West Virginians to Senator Manchin's office. We have nearly 500, uh, nearly almost 500 connections already. Uh, and so with your help, we can connect even more folks to uh, Senator Manchin's uh, office. So go sign up with that link right now. Mike, I apologize and to the audience because this is super important. I'm gonna actually hold up this webinar until we get 20 people signed up to TextBank next week. So let's take a look, where are we? Because I know everybody is jumping on right now to sign up. Come on, we can do it. Come on. All right, Mike, I, I know you're going to sign up for all the shifts you can possibly sign up for. <laughs> all right, we have some people signing up now. All right, we're at 10 signups. Just 10 more, and then we can move on to the, uh, our next speaker. And don't be shy, sign up for multiple shifts. Thank you, Erica. All right, we just got to 20. Great job, everyone. Thank you so much. What you're gonna be doing next week and the following week is so important. Uh, it's really gonna make a difference. Uh, so to get a West Virginia perspective, up next is Angie Rosser. Uh, Executive Director of West Virginia Rivers. But before I turn it over to Angie, I'd like to say what a pleasure it's been to work with Angie for the past year in West Virginia. Around here at CCAN, we call her the Mansion Whisperer. We rarely do anything without talking to her first. 
We're so lucky to have Angie in West Virginia at this very critical moment. Thank you, Angie, for joining us today. Well, thanks, Quentin and Mike and C. Kian and Lena and Reverend Malcolm. Appreciated your comments. Appreciate everybody, you know, signing up for the text banking. I mean, that's just a reminder of um, we're not alone and we're all in this together. And uh, the the work in West Virginia over the past year or more has been exceptionally intense. And um, having folks like C. Kian have our backs and and uh, work side by side with us and know that we would not be even be at this moment um, without the broader national climate movement rallying around. But as you can imagine, um, things are complicated and delicate here. And as I mentioned, intense intensity seems to be the theme. And we, from a scale of one to 10, I think we've been on like 11 for the past 12 months of doing what we can to educate West Virginians about what they have at stake in terms of this energy transition and the impact of climate change. And I've been doing um, advocacy in West Virginia for 28 years now, but it wasn't really um, until uh, three years ago that we started really trying to figure out how we even talk about climate change and the climate crisis in West Virginia. Um, we are a fossil fuel state. This is this transition that is happening is already uh, causing economic suffering to, to our coal communities. Um, so when we talk about climate change, we also have to talk about taking care of people and what a just transition and a fair and equitable transition looks like. So that's been uh, the nature of our work. And, um, you know, also showing people, my neighbors, people who live here, you know, what we have at stake in terms of being a state that has a, a lot to lose if we don't do this transition right, and certainly a lot to gain if we do these climate investments correctly. And that's been our work with Senator Manchin uh, over the past couple of years. We are invested in the belief that Senator Manchin will stay with his word that he can and will support a budget reconciliation package. He's been consistent and talking about tax reforms that are needed and consistent about talking um, in terms of uh, consensus or agreement around the climate investment and also uh, ways to lower prescription drugs and, and address in inflation. And we know from our nearly weekly check-ins with his staff that they are working hard um, they did a lot of work on this, as, as Mike mentioned at the top of the call, uh, through the Energy and Natural Resources Committee that Senator Manchin shares of getting um, climate provisions in uh, the, the budget reconciliation bill that was uh, drafted last year. We are hoping and, and counting on that, that work to continue as part of the package. And there, you know, we've had to be very strategic and thoughtful of how to reach West Virginians where they're at with these issues and be able to find the best ways to express the urgency and again, what we have to gain in terms of policy investments, quality of life, uh, if a strong and when a strong budget reconciliation package passes. And an example of that is, um, you know, not just talking about, certainly talking about climate, but not just about climate, um, because there are other things in budget reconciliation that mean a lot to West Virginians and, and could make important things happen. And, and this goes to sort of the moral argument that Reverend Malcolm was bringing up about an hour and a half ago, we were standing in, in Charleston next to minors who are suffering from black lung disease. And the Black Lung Disability Trust Fund expired and in uh, 2021 and, and needs reauthorized and the budget reconciliation package seems to be the only pathway to be able to address that disability fund in, in this year and to make sure our West Virginia miners who have sacrificed life and limb to help power the nation for a generation or more that their medical issues as a result of risking their lives in underground coal mining are taken care of. So those miners uh, stood together with our community members saying, we're counting on you, Joe Manchin, to help make sure that our medical needs are taken care of, get the black lung ex 
uh, trust fund extension in budget reconciliation. We're also talking about um, some of the uh, family and worker supports that could, West Virginians could benefit from and these climate investments, which are gonna help a place like my home state uh, get through whether this transition um, from fossil fuels to, to cleaner forms of energy and, and not get left behind. So we're gonna continue with this education, this push in this coming weeks. We've got a six week plan for this final push. We'll need all your help with us. We're doing the phone calls. We would love to have help um, following up with folks who have taken actions. We just simply don't have the staffing or the, the volunteer power in state to handle it all. So could we use all of your help with that and, and um, you know, making sure that, that uh, West Virginia's voices and interests are heard in this process. So thanks again, CCAN. Thanks again, everybody on this call for hanging in there. I know, I know <laughs> it's been a roller coaster ride, emotional time, um, a frustrating time. We're all feeling that and carrying that. And it just helps us to know that we're not carrying it alone. And that, that uh, you remember the, the people of West Virginia who are, are there with you, standing by you, fighting to make sure that future generations don't suffer the worst effects of climate change. So thanks for hanging in there. We're almost there. Back to you, Mike. Angie, so much. Uh, and uh, hey, it's been an honor to uh, be in the trenches with all of y'all in West Virginia. And uh, uh, we are going to win. And we have a number of questions that people have already posted. And we're going to read those questions in a second. Uh, if you have any others, remember, go to the Q&A function on the webinar and just type your question in there. Um, I will say, uh, Angie, one of my favorite moments of advocating for this reconciliation package was one night in, uh, I think it was October, being part of a phone bank, uh, calling folks in West Virginia, uh, and seeing if they wanted to be patched through to Joe Manchin's uh, uh, voice uh, recording machine in Washington, D.C. And it was, it was, you know, uh, a little after dinner time, time for kids to go to bed, and this gentleman and uh, outside of Charleston picked up and I was talking to him and I could hear he was holding a baby. You know, I could hear the baby fussing, you know, really close to the phone. So I think that baby was on his shoulder. Uh, and I was ready to say, you know, I'm sorry to bother you. Clearly you're busy. We'll call some other time. And anyway, he asked, you know, what, what, what I was calling for. And I told him, you know, we're trying to get your Senator to vote the right way on, on this reconciliation package and on climate, especially. Uh, and he said, sure, patch me through. And so on this patch through method, you can actually hear the person leaving a message. You can hear the outgoing message of Joe Manchin. You've just reached my office in Washington, DC. I look forward to hearing your message. Please leave a message. So I hear that. And, and this gentleman's holding his baby and she's still fussing and crying a bit. And then it's time for him to leave a message. Yeah, he, you hear the beep. Uh, and this guy says, Senator Manchin, you know, uh, my name is Bob. I live outside of Charleston. And you can still hear the baby, you know, fussing and crying. And he goes, and what you're hearing in the background, Senator, is Lucy. And Lucy is nine months old. And she is counting on you to do the right thing, to save our planet, to transition us and our workers to clean energy and to keep our nation prosperous. Uh, and then you hear Lucy just in the background again, and then he hangs up. And I, I mean, it was so powerful. I wish so much I'd recorded it. Uh, but those voices are there in West Virginia. They're being sent to Senator Manchin. They're inspiring all of us. Angie, you inspire us. Everything that y'all do with West Virginia Rivers. And let's just, let's just see this thing through. And uh, I'm now going to pitch it to uh, Quentin, who's going to give us a final volunteer pitch and highlight some other actions. Then we're going to uh, direct some questions to our panelists. So hang in there, everyone. Quentin. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, that was a very powerful night of phone banking. So many volunteers that have helped out so far have stories just like that. Uh, and in the past, we've been doing the phone banking, but this time we thought we would change it up and do text banking. 
And so I dropped it in the chat just uh, to sign up again if you haven't already. And it doesn't take much. It takes about one hour of your time. You can send hundreds of text messages through our Call Hub text app, and you can have dozens of conversations from the comfort of your home. In my opinion, it's the easiest way to do outreach. So like I said, if you haven't signed up, please go ahead and sign up uh, right, uh, right through that link right now. Uh, but the great thing is we're not the only ones taking action in the month of May to, to make sure that reconciliation passes. Uh, Defend Our Future is having a Senate Climate can Wait rally on Tuesday, May 17th. And I'm gonna drop that event in the chat as well. Just give me a second. And then also on May 19th, we have Moms Clean Air Force and Climate Action Campaign are having a art action on, uh, like I said, May Thursday, May 19th. And I'm gonna drop that also mobilized link in the chat. Uh, and if you can't join our, web, uh, our text banking, please join one of these other great events. And then finally, I would like to highlight uh, in, at the very end of May, Climate Action Campaign is doing Flood the Phones action the week of May 27th. Uh, they're just asking you everyone to call their senator uh, and also tweet and post messages. And here is the guidance that they shared with us earlier today. Uh, so like I said, if you aren't able to text, uh, please join one of these other great, amazing opportunities to volunteer. Uh, this is the next two to three weeks are gonna be so critical. Uh, and so by participating in one of these great events, you are making a difference and influence in the outcome of reconciliation. So let's get it done. And I know I'm feeling really inspired from this group and I will be participating myself. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, and uh, we do have some questions. Uh, and I also, I do believe that Quentin, we will be following up uh, after this webinar to everyone who RSVP'd and we'll email you these same links, these same opportunities uh, for folks to take action. Uh, in the meantime, we do have some questions. Uh, and uh, Angie, the, the, the first question is for you. Uh, and the question is, um, have you seen Senator Manchin move at all in his position on climate change and coal in the years that you have been working with them? Absolutely. Um, you know, he was well known, I guess, in his first Senate run for shooting the cap and trade, shooting a bullet in an advertisement through the cap and trade bill. Um, and it was, uh, you, you know, that posture has changed. I think there is a, sen a growing sense of acceptance by Senator Manchin and by West Virginians that this energy transition is happening, whether we like it or not. And we better make sure that West Virginia workers and communities aren't left behind and that there is um, you know, a, a groundswell from some of our local governments and state electeds to really try to open the gates to more investments in renewable energy or clean manufacturing, the jobs of the future, I call them. So I think that's helped a lot um, move him. Although, you know, I think there's a reality check of are we going to just get off coal or oil and gas um, overnight? Um, that 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 is more of a challenge for people to wrap their heads around. It doesn't feel like it's based in the reality when you're looking around our communities here. Um, so, but definitely showing incremental um, pieces and and. and uh, yeah, I think he understands um, more and more that that the time is now, and that we can't we can't be left behind in this transition. Got it. Thank you very much, Angie. Our next question is for Quentin, uh, and it could be for Quentin and Lena. And the question is, if our senators in our state are already supportive of reconciliation. Does it matter if we contact them? Uh, Quentin, do you want to take that one? Uh, absolutely, it's important. Uh, as Lena mentioned earlier, uh, some of our senators are in a good place, but they can certainly influence and direct the conversation. Uh, they can help uh, ask the right questions. They can bring the right information and context to other senators who might not be in a strong position. Uh, and quite honestly, 
we're in a position of we need Democrats to prioritize this. Uh, of course, they're supportive. We talked to Warner and Kane and you know uh, Van Hollen and the folks in our sort of backyard at CCAN. And they and every time we talk to them, it's yes, 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 we support it. But we just need them to not make it a top five priority. We need this to be their absolute top priority. And having those conversations with your senator uh, will definitely uh, make a difference. Great. And Lena, the next question is for you. And the question is, what can we do to address the crisis with the solar energy market with the investigation and apparent uh, stop or slowdown in importing solar panels? Great question. Yeah, I'm so glad that folks are hearing about this and are, well, I'm not glad because it's a debacle that's happening. Uh, if folks aren't aware, there's an investigation by the Commerce Department about some solar manufacturers potentially skirting a tariff that is really aimed to protect domestic manufacturing. And in, in many ways, it's a very good idea and is precisely why we need to invest in our domestic clean energy industries so that we can lead the world in producing clean energy. But the reality is, is that right now we're not. And many of our solar panels that need to go up as states and localities are making this transition to clean energy are manufactured in other parts of the world. And while the Commerce Department is investigating this claim that uh, some companies are trying to skirt this uh, tariff, they have essentially frozen the solar industry right now, and it's extremely problematic um, because we know that we need to be deploying more and more clean energy, including solar, and not pausing things because of a bureaucratic investigation. So that's all to say. I'm going to put a link into the chat as soon as I stop talking um, so that you can con uh, contact the Commerce Department to let them know that they need to come to quick resolution about this investigation so that we can support our solar industry and ensure that they're able to get back to installing solar panels uh, quick and uh, robustly all over the country. I'll put that action alert in there uh, right away and hopefully Commerce will take action. We have heard that there's a possibility they can come to resolution on this, hopefully within a number of weeks, if not a number of months, and then they need to move past this quickly. And again, it's all the more reason that we need to pass these investments that will help support domestic manufacturing of clean energy and ensure that we are leading the world uh, in clean energy industries. Great, thank you. Um, uh, we only have one more question unless someone on the call wants to drop something else in the Q&A. Uh, and that question is uh, kind of on the sobering side and, and it is, why is it taking so long to pass reconciliation? We hear reports that Gina McCarthy is frustrated and maybe thinking of leaving, is the White House truly prioritizing reconciliation? Uh, Lena, you wanna take that one first? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, it is a really good question. Uh, it is one that has frustrated me and my colleagues and so many of us here um, because for a number of reasons, I would say it's been so positive to see the administration. They started out with such great climate goals and with such good staff uh, to be pushing climate and action on climate and environmental justice as a top priority. And they've faltered and it is incredibly frustrating. Uh, and I think, honestly, I think a lot of it comes down to these crazy personality conflicts and Joe Manchin uh, didn't like the way that it was handled in December. And we as a movement need to make sure that this administration and every single one of our elected officials gets their head out of the sand and moves past these personality conflicts and realizes that this is the existential challenge of our time and that people are dying. The longer that we wait to take action, the more people are going to die and they have a chance to avert this worst of the worst crises um, and make sure that they prioritize it. I think one of the reasons is that the administration has so many things on their plate, right? And they are admittedly dealing with a lot of very challenging issues from the pandemic to the war in Ukraine now to inflation that sadly they've deprioritized this. 
And again, it's all the more reason that we need to weigh in with fervor and energy and to every single senator so that they are also lifting this up as a priority to Leader Schumer and to Senator Manchin to make sure that this gets done. And it's in their political interest to do it. People voted for Democrats to take action on this issue. And it will help them in the midterm elections if they deliver on this issue. And that's another point that we can drive home to them because they're also always thinking as political animals and, and we can reinforce that for them. This is good for them to take action here, not to mention all the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. And uh, I, you know, there, for those of you on this call who've ever been part of a legislative campaign, uh, at the state level or federal level, if you've worked on a campaign from the introduction through hearings and negotiations and to God willing to final passage, if you've been through that experience as I have and others on this call have, one thing you know for sure is that on a big bill, everything that can go wrong will go wrong before you get to the finish line. Uh, there will be moments when you think there's no hope. There will be frustrating moments. There will be peaks and valleys. Uh, and But you have to keep going. Uh, when you give up, you automatically obviously don't win. The big bills require superhuman commitment from activists like us, advocates, uh, our, our legislative leaders, our, our, our leaders in the executive branch. It's the only way it gets done. And, and this bill is following a similar pattern. I mean, start out gangbusters, you know, it seems like everything's going right. Then you hit a few bumps in the road and then a few things get sliced and diced and uh, compromises have to be made, but it's still a really big, good bill. And then it's taking longer than people want. And then other political issues form uh, annoying distractions on and on and on. I've never been part of a big legislative campaign at the state level or federal level where this same pattern didn't take place. So this is par for the course. Uh, we don't have a right to give up, uh, and nor do our leaders. Um, you know, we think of all the great social movements of the past where people were literally beaten and thrown in jail or killed. Uh, and people in that movement kept pressing forward, kept pressing forward. Um, we have to do that now. We can't let these setbacks set us back. We have to maintain our optimism, our strength, and, and knowing that the truth is on our side and knowing that we're close. We are close. If nothing else you've heard on this webinar, that we're close, that Joe Manchin has never said hell no to climate spending. In fact, he said he wants it. He points it out. He highlights it as what he wants to reach a deal on. Um, so we got to put pressure on the White House. We got to put pressure on our senators. Uh, we got to keep going, even when we think we're drained, even think, when we think we've given all we can, even when we wonder, is it worth it? Are we getting anywhere? The answer is we are. It's a year later. We're still fighting. We still have 50 votes ready to be cast. That's what we keep hearing. So we're, we will follow up with everyone with a, a follow-up email that will include a recording of this webinar. It will include all the various actions folks can take. Um, we look forward to joining you on some of these text banks into West Virginia, uh, calling your U.S. Senator wherever you live, and we are going to stay in touch because we are going to win, and we are looking forward to the, to the celebration webinar that we'll have in August or September or the big party we're going to have in DC when we finally get this over the finish line. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everyone on the CCAN Action staff who worked very hard to pull this webinar together, Clinton Scott, Jamie DeMarco, our whole communications team. Thank you so much. I want to thank Lena Moffitt of Evergreen Action. Thank you for keeping us at CCAN going. You guys inspire us. We really appreciate all the work that you do. Uh, Angie Rosser uh, with West Virginia Rivers. Uh, we're going to have at least one of those celebrations in, in, in the beautiful mountains of West Virginia. I know we will. And Reverend M Michael Malcolm, founder and director of the People's Justice Council. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day as a speaker, uh, as a, a participant, a viewer, and an attendee of this webinar. We are going to stay in touch. Um, we're going to hold you close and we're gonna win. So with that, 
Have a good day. Thank you everyone for being on this webinar. We'll talk to you soon.